you know we've heard a lot around digital transformation automation etc but i think uh, this session is going to focus on something that is very fundamental uh, to the cfo's role which is around corporate governance so one of the main priorities for businesses especially these days is survival while that often means items such as corporate governance may take a back seat to accomplish that goal uh, they are still important to achieving long term stability and growth we have with us Byron Loughlin, Global Head of Board Management for NASDAQ to talk to us about how CFOs can develop their corporate governance strategy to sustain current and future growth. I mean, especially with a focus around, uh, you know, the disruption that we witnessed uh, over the last 12 months. So over to you, Byron. Uh, good evening. It's uh, nice to be with you and uh, thank you for having me today. I was enjoying uh, some of the comments in the previous sessions and particularly I wanted to uh, reflect uh, and kick off my session with um reflecting on Samir's comments about black swan events um this is something that in the in the boardroom is often of concern and uh and so as i as we're talking through this feel free to ask me questions what i spend my time doing is working with boards and CEOs around uh developing resilient governance and so that will be the fo focus of my discussion today and any questions that you have i do spend a fair amount of time with both ceos and cfos on certain issues related to governance and particularly boardroom and committee issues so if you have some questions for me uh regarding board interaction i'd be happy to uh to work with you on those the um there's there's been through this black swan event that we've experienced over the last year there's been considerable evolution in the governance processes of organizations namely as was discussed earlier uh or reflected on earlier was the movement to uh digital boardrooms for example and that's been a a considerable change because many um had not utilized some of the technologies like zoom prior to last year and uh and so the idea of using a uh, a platform like this that we're on today this is this is new within the last 18 months in terms of using it universally and using it in the boardroom prior there was many concerns about having a uh, a non in person board uh meeting and and we've learned to work within that so it, it's it's emphasizing this need for us to adapt and grow through the processes of tr digital transformation a few concepts i will um i will offer it that we're seeing these are these are um areas in which we're seeing change in global governance you know when we work in governance some of the the um the areas that we focus on that um you may or may not be familiar with in the united states we do not have a a code of sorts it's mostly done by precedence law and by by issues debated through um interestingly enough the state of Delaware it's important to understand that in uh in the United States with our 50 states that certain states have influence over national law because they set precedents that are adopted by other states and therefore it becomes like national law though it's not law uh, always law it's it's um it's precedence and therefore it becomes adopted for example the three primary duties of a board the duty of care the duty of loyalty and the duty to monitor primarily come out of the state of Delaware so in what we're seeing is an evolution though and a change in governance overall the first one i'll put up is you've heard a considerable amount likely of discussion around the idea of of purpose and uh the purpose of a company and um and one of the areas that we study here at the Nasdaq Center for Board Excellence is what's driving both global governance but also global business uh, expansion and um and through this global business expansion that we see in the governance side of of where I spend my time we see india south africa uh we see to an extent the eu but great britain and australia are for those being major regions that are influencing global governance 
you have securities exchange in India, the FRC in Great Britain. You have um, the King Code in South Africa and the and the code in in Australia are are four of the key drivers around um, global governance today. And um, but globally, we're seeing that this equation is playing out more and more. I was um, meeting with a board yesterday, and and that was a majority part of the discussion for us was leadership guidance human capital management and and governance that drives business to excel and that leads us into areas of examination this is a concept that will become increasingly familiarized around the world it, VUCA is is an acronym for volatility uncertainty complexity and ambiguity and and Reflecting back on Samir's comments about uh, Black Swan events and his optimism, uh, part of that um, that I'm seeing in the boardroom is uh, optimism is is lessons learned from this uh, this global pandemic and the resiliency of the economy globally and how quickly we were able to move uh within these kinds of areas and and we're learning to understand the correlation between possible events and uh and therefore overlaying that or understanding how we can predict more uh effectively these kinds of things now i look back on the last several years um one of the areas that um VUCA played out was in our clients who were already um, doing black swan kinds of tabletop exercises. In, in other words, imagining what might happen. We had several large global clients that they were emphasizing through their board interaction. They would take a day, a year, and they would look into where is, where is their strategy moving and adapting to the changes of the world. And they would look at those changes and possible changes through this Buka type of lens. The, um, the other area that we're seeing in, and the, the VUCA concept plays straight into ESG trends are, are these kinds of areas. We, we see that, um, one ESG is here to stay and it's one that we're adapting to. You see companies like Tesla, adapting to ESG through um, developing not only their own, but working with others around battery technologies and electric technologies and therefore solar technologies, uh, which um, impact wind and, um, and other uh, energy capturing technologies. And then um, alignment of the seven stakeholder, um, the stakeholder, those stakeholders being the, the uh, employees, the customer, the um, the vendors, the company itself, the shareholders, and so on, and these key stakeholders and understanding the stakeholders and climate risk is as we try to move more and more towards a net zero, uh, carbon net zero, and um, and so what what these trends help us understand is the future risks, and these are the areas that. Um, that boards are wrestling with in terms of understanding what are the key areas that we need to focus upon in terms of this ESG that's evolved to be a something here that is is to stay. And so we've got the environmental, social, and governance. This is a uh, slide, and if you would like this slide, um, feel free to to send me a message. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to share these with you. Um, this is one that we work with a law firm, a global law firm, Paul Weiss, on ESG activities because we have a um, here at Nasdaq we have an ESG advisory division, and so the these are the key areas that we've identified and work within uh, the that board members are seeking to understand more effectively, and as a CFO, therefore, you want to be able to work with your board and with your CEO and understanding how do these impact risk in your organization? And so how do financial institutions begin to manage these kinds of risk? And, and what we've, what we've identified is that you want to integrate climate risk into your overall, uh, financial risk management framework and leverage the, the tools that we have today. We have fantastic 
uh, analysis tools. Um, I, I, I was interested by the comment on, on how um, few tools are being utilized, and that, and naturally, uh, in it in the earlier session, that is, and and naturally that that indicates the opportunity that companies have, and not only in India but around the world, to produce tools that help companies leverage understanding around risk analysis and how to identify um, not only risk, because as we look at the mitigation of risk, we're also looking for the opportunity so that we don't miss opportunities, and, which is another risk. Um, and to strategically focus on the, the G, and, and, and I'll emphasize this, that what I'm saying here is the G that guides the E, S, and D, and D is digital transformation. The, the, one of the areas that's interestingly missed in this acronym ESG is, is the D factor because it's, it's ubiquitous and it's with us and uh, therefore ever present. So the D factor, the digital transformation factor is, is one of those that's driving our, uh, not only our understanding, but our ability to wrestle with and to, uh, measure the ES and G items. So, and, coordinating and cooperating with all stakeholders. That's gaining input. For example, we're seeing more directors interact with shareholders. We're seeing human capital management as being much more emphasized than it was ever was in the past, because that means talent management and, and capturing those opportunities through, the, through not only identifying um, highly talented present and future employees, but also training to to grow up our workforce so that we're growing the economies um, overall through not only education, but growing um, growing the human capital side of and, and the human, the people piece of the governance equation. And then um, a, a key part of ESG is that we're ensuring that uh, senior management understands the, the wider and more global risks. Too, too often, um, management teams are are focused on the those items that are readily at hand and one of the areas where uh, either CFOs or part of the, the financial team can help identify those other risks that can impact and uh, can also augment our, our ability to address the, the risk and the opportunities before the organization. And there and um, and so in the ESG area uh, You've, you're probably already wrestling with this, and um, and some of my colleagues, uh, Megan and some and uh, Sarev are, are with me today. That one of the other areas that we're um, we've expanded at Nasdaq along with our governance tools is a is a tool called One Report that deals with new technology that addresses ESG disclosures and um, and that helps identification of materiality in terms of ESG. And, um, and, a, and then um, a, an item to highlight is this ongoing um, metrics around, and I emphasize this because investors, if you follow some of the, the larger global investors, they're emphasizing the metrics around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so identifying creativity to support that human capital management element. So for, so key learnings for CFOs, invest in uh, helping the management team understand how to invest employees in that um, capital management side and um, learning to understand these VUCA kinds of risks. And, um, and then um, scenario planning is key to understanding the what ifs, what can happen in the future. So this, th this pandemic has been one type of, of uh, global risk impact, but in any company, a significant risk um, that that uh, is encountered is like could be like a pandemic if it's uh, if it's as impactful as this and um, and one thing I'll emphasize I am seeing and hearing from my clients that there we are presently entering into a phase of of um, supply chain risk um, I, I'll I, I even personally have experienced that um, some of the automobile manufacturers that we work with they're starting to have to build automobiles without certain features, um, less critical features. Um, they're, they're trying to overcome this 
but some of the features in their automobiles are not available because of supply chain breakdown at present. So it's one of those risks to, um, to emphasize and, and look forward into because it's part of that VUCA equation. And as you know, we're all looking um, both over the next year, but, but longer term, understanding longer term risk and longer term, longer term strategy. Uh, finally, um, last couple slides is what this what this helps us achieve at both yourself as a leader in the in the CFO ranks of an organization and help the board and your CEO is to become a more agile leader. Instead of that, what we've learned um, over the last say 15 years, particularly is agility is a key part of not only leadership but organizations' abilities to to um, respond to to uh, and it, it respond to when they encounter events like the current pandemic. And so an agile leader is one that's anticipating change, that's monitoring proactively rather than reactively, um, that's generating confidence in the organization, that's um, achieving alignment within the organization. That means seeing, seeing the, the areas of need between say the board and the management team and then the human capital management ele element and and then um, one of the key areas that I see for for successful leaders because we do work with um, we we work with it as you can imagine at Nasdaq with a considerable number of of um, the the Nasdaq 100 is a, a very um, influential group of business leaders around the around the world and these are uh, what we're seeing as a common thread is seeking to liberate thinking within the organization so that um, in that human capital management equation, you can capture more creativity and, uh, and then that elevates results. So finally, global governance um, priorities and predictions for 2021. Climate risk is, um, will be uh, top of mind for many of the largest investors. Diversity, equity, inclusion is uh, is also being emphasized. Sustainability reporting standards are are coming into effect. The human capital management piece, in other words, retention is one of the key metrics that uh, that also investors are following. Um, we'll see more and more investors returning to activism, and in, and as the mar capital markets increase in activity, meaning that. Um, We've had a focus on technology over the last year, as you've seen recently. We're seeing a, a more balanced view towards the markets in, in investing. And so um, that will bring into, uh, as we as airplanes start to fly again and so on, we're going to see more, um, more and increased activism towards those things above. And then virtual board and shareholder meetings, to some extent, are here to stay. We'll see how those evolve. But... Um, uh, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks, uh, Byron. One quick question before uh, we wrap up this session. You know, what is your take on excessive focus on short-termism and the impact that has on that it has on yeah. government? So, going back to my my profit equation at the beginning, this is a key um, change that we're seeing, and, and that is the those companies that are look that have looked at profit as being a long term um, at, rather than short term. The change has been that institutional investment uh, companies, I mean, think about this for a mo moment. The, the company BlackRock, led by uh, Larry Fink, if you're, if you're unfamiliar with the details of this, I encourage you to read his letter. You can Google it very quickly and uh, pull it up. His letter to CFO, CEOs annually and the emphasis on a much more long-term view. Now, Larry Fink came out of um, came out of another large firm in which he actually did not do particularly well. He learned from that in 1985. He started um, BlackRock. Today, this company manage has assets under management of over 8.2 trillion dollars. To put that into uh, perspective, the U.S. budget is is four trillion dollars. Those are different metrics. I know you CFOs are going to say, wait, what's the connection? It's more the magnitude of assets under management being $8 trillion. Well, $25 trillion 
is now steering towards long-termism rather than short-termism. That 25 is the largest um, asset managers in the world are looking at an equation more like this than that short-termism of the past. Sure, thanks, uh, thanks, Byron. That's uh, you know some very interesting insights and a lot for our CFOs to chew on. Uh, I'm sure if there are more questions, we will direct them to you, and then you know you can respond to them offline. But thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Mm-hmm.